It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you would take your Bibles and turn to the second book of Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2. If you'd like to use one of the Bibles in front of you, you'll find it in the back of the Bible on page 169. I want to just read the, what's kind of the last paragraph of chapter 2, and we'll only focus on actually the last three verses of this chapter this morning as we, we think about how to evangelism and discipleship. Let me start with verse 22, though. Paul tells young Pastor Timothy to flee youthful passions or youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, or patient when wronged, correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. As I said, this is how to, a how to sermon, if you will, evangelism and discipleship. Or if you're a purist, We really should just say it's how to discipleship. I mean, Jesus said, go and make disciples. Go there, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe or to obey all that I've commanded you. And as we look to this chapter, in chapter 2, the whole chapter, especially the end, we're going to look at this disciple maker and what a disciple maker looks like and kind of a how-to, again, if you will. And a good disciple maker, of course, is going to follow the good shepherd. And the good shepherd uh, wins those who are yet to believe, and then he continues to win those who already believe with the same gospel. And so as we come to this second chapter of Timothy, it begins Paul telling Timothy that if you're going to be a good disciple maker then uh, you're going to be making disciples. A good discipler not only makes disciples, though, but his disciples make disciples, and it's passed on and on and on. And I mean, verse 2, it's a familiar verse to most of you. What you have heard from me, Paul says, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Paul, to Timothy, to faithful men, who then will entrust it to other faithful men until it continues and continues and continues to today where we get to be part of this same chain, the same process of passing this along. And then in this chapter, what Paul does is he gives six metaphors, and he, and he shows Timothy, this young pastor, this is what a faithful man or a faithful woman, if you will, looks like. This is what a disciple maker looks like. Now, first and foremost, it was to him as a pastor, but it really expands to all of us. We'll see very readily as we look at this. But in these six metaphors, he begins... In verse 3, and he says, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. He's he's focused as a soldier and he's committed. And then the second uh, metaphor that he uses, he said he's a a good discipler, a faithful one. Is not just a soldier, but he's an athlete. He's obedient. He follows the rules. We're obedient to God. But not only a good soldier and a good athlete, but a hard worker, like the hard-working farmer. And then you go on in the chapter, verse 15, a a God-approved workman. A workman who, who doesn't need to have any reason to be ashamed, that rightly handles this word of truth. So be a good soldier, be a good athlete, be a hard-working farmer, be a workman who, who has no need to be ashamed. The fifth metaphor, you find it towards the end of the chapter in, in the 20s, and, and it's this, this clean vessel, one who's been cleaned up and able to be used by God. But the one we're going to look at this morning will begin in verse 24, and it's the sixth metaphor, the sixth picture here, and 
is this servant, the Lord's servant, or the Lord's bond slave, or it wouldn't even be wrong to have it translated the Lord's willing slave even here. It's one that's his, that's willingly his, that's a servant, that's a slave of God. And, and in this how-to evangelism and discipleship, as it were, and I said, you know, the good discipler, he follows the good shepherd in winning those yet to believe and also continuing to win those who believe with the same gospel. And he says, if you're a good, good servant, if you're the Lord's servant, then you're going to be able to teach. But in order to be able to teach, in order to be able to communicate truth, in such a way that people can hear the truth and even accept the truth, and God can even and will even transform somebody through the truth, then there's a way to do that. You need to be able to teach. But if you're going to do that, he gives very, very pra- gets very practical here. Then you're not going to be quarrelsome, but you're going to be kind to everyone. If you're able to teach... That's first. If you're going to be able to teach and really communicate and people get the truth, you're going to be patient. Patient when wronged. Or patiently enduring evil is another good way to translate that. And then he says, or gentle. Correcting your opponent with gentleness. Being able to present the truth in love. And then God may perhaps, God may perhaps grant repentance leading to this knowledge of the truth. What I want to do is I want to look at each of these <laughs> commands, if you will, that God says that we're to follow, that, that we're to be about, or, or maybe a better way to say that is descriptions of who we are if we're the Lord's servant. But what I want to start with is right at the end of this chapter, just this last phrase. Look at it with me, if you will. After being captured by him to do his will. Who's he talking about? Captured by whom? Well, you put it in context, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. And so it's captured by the devil to do his will. And they need to come to their senses, these people that he's talking about. And it's interesting, isn't it, to to have these bookends of verses 24 and 26. The Lord's servant, the Lord's slave here, the one who is is willingly God's, isn't able to help this one who's unwillingly been captured, been snared. Now, we've all been there. Every one of us has been there. I I, I just read from... Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, and you, Paul writes to the Christian, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, that'd be the devil that he's talking about in, in 2 Timothy, among whom we also once lived in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. So we say, okay, we were all once there, and we want to help people who are still there to know that they can be reconciled to God, that they can hear and know the truth. But can you get back there? Can you be trapped again? Can you be captured again once the Lord has actually captured your heart? Peter sure seemed to be, didn't he? Simon, Simon. Satan has demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. Remember Peter's response? This was right before Jesus went to the cross, of course. Remember Peter's response? No. (laughs) No, not me. Lord, I'll go to prison for you. I'll go to death for you. And his alarm clock didn't even go off before he denied him three times. And that was Peter. It's no wonder that Peter would later write, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, if you want to look it up later, after, after he had denied Jesus and after he had come to repentance and after he had been literally restored by Jesus, then he would later write, be sober-minded, be watchful. Why? 
Because your adversary, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know, the lion is sandy colored just like his environment, isn't he? And he does his hunting at night and he's still. And even though he can run, they say about 35 miles an hour, this big 500 pound beast or so, he, he, he goes in short bursts and he just he, he, he sneaks on his prey and he grabs them and he catches them unaware. And he goes for the, for the, for the weak ones in the, in the flocks or the herds that he goes after. Paige was, uh, grown, she grew up next door to a zookeeper. And so being next door to a zookeeper, she was able to see all these exotic animals in her neighborhood. And the, the zookeeper would bring them home at night and they'd go and pet these animals. And so after we were married and had young children, we went back to the Memphis zoos where she was born in Memphis. And, and, and the zookeeper actually took us back behind big cat country. And so you're going back there, you know, and the lions and the tigers and the black panthers and all the, these, these incredible beasts. And, but when you're behind the scenes in big cat country and there's, you know, the big in, enclosures, there, there's not as much between you and them as on the other side. I mean, there are the bars there, but you can see that they can easily get their paws through those bars. There's not any mesh and stuff like that. And so, you know, we're, we're kind of, you know, sitting back. And, uh, but it didn't take too long. We start just kind of getting comfortable back there. And we were watching this black panther. And it was a huge enclosure that it was in. And, and uh, I'm holding Michaela. She's, she must have just been able to walk. Or maybe she couldn't walk yet. I know she could stand, but I don't think she could walk yet. And she was just a little thing. And I'm holding her in my arms. And somebody pointed out, said, look, that black panther's stalking her. And sure enough, across the way, probably 30 yards away, this thing had crouched down. And it had focused on this little girl. And so we start watching this thing, and, and, it, and it's, I mean, it seemed like a long, it was a long time. I don't know how long it was, but it seemed like a really long time. And it started making its way, and it would, you know, and you, you, it wouldn't even move. And then you'd kind of act like you weren't watching, and you'd see it move and get behind something. And it was just making her way, its way over towards her. But what happened, it took so long that we just started in conversation and kind of forgot about it. And so I'm holding her. And as I'm holding her and the, 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 the bars are right there, at some point, I'm going to just let her down. And so I go to put her down, and as soon as I get down to the ground, boom, that panther comes. And we're all just, ah, you know, and, and, and jumping back. And it comes, and it hits the bar, and it hits its head, and it comes through the bars. And it, and it just, we're far enough back then that it doesn't do anything. But as I thought, I thought, well, first of all, I thought, I'm going to use that as an illustration one day, and I finally got to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but the devil that Paul's talking about, this, this black panther is a little kitty compared. And it just caused me to, to, to begin to think of, uh, you know, that's it. You know, we, we kind of lose sight and we forget. We don't even think about it anymore. And he... And he pounces, and he still does that. I think one of the greatest traps, one of the greatest snares, if you use the word here that Paul uses of the devil today, is to cause us to think, well, this is, this is little kitty Sunday school stuff. This is, you know, the devil, that's just who we talk about in Sunday school. Those of you that are teaching little kitty Sunday school stuff, thank you. And this is foundational. This is truth. It's not little kitty Sunday school stuff. It's preparing us for reality of life. I mean, he, I think one of the, a great trap, little kitty Sunday school stuff, it's, he, he's, he's a Halloween costume now, isn't he? I mean, and it, and it causes people to disbelieve, to not believe in the reality of what the Bible is saying here, to be ready, to be aware that it's true. 
What, what other kind of traps? I've just been thinking about these traps this week as I've been, been, been pondering this passage. And, and, and if you look up just a few verses, one of the great traps that, that is to just getting people to, to swerve a little bit from the truth. Verse 18 these, he talks about these people who have swerved from the truth, and the people he's speaking of are verse 17. Uh, I'll go back to 16. Avoid a reverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. I mean, this is, these are strong words, aren't they? Among them are Hymenaeus and Phil- Philetus, who have, well, that, that doesn't sound that strong if you just start in verse 18. They, okay, they just. They've just kind of swerved a little bit from the truth. But remember he said it's, it spreads like gangrene. It's a disease. It destroys. It's poisonous. It's cancer. Now what did they believe? Well, it seems they, they believed in Jesus. It seems they believe he died and rose from the dead. It seemed they believed even that Jesus was coming back to get them. But they swerved a little bit and said, well, he's already come back. And Paul says, boy, that sure is upsetting the faith of some. But God's firm foundation stands. Bearing this seal, the Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. And it's interesting, isn't it? He talks about swerving from the truth and how it spreads like gangrene, and and then he goes straight into, but if you're his... You depart from iniquity. You depart from sin. Why? I've been doing this, this. I mean, I've been a pastor almost 27 years now. And invariably, when I have people that I'm counseling, that I'm talking to, and they've, they've, they're involved in something that's captured them, a sin. They're involved in something, whether from, from pornography to, to, to cheating to to just whatever the, 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 the sin may be, to just not treating someone like they should, it's almost always, always I can trace it back to a swerving from the truth and just moving away from this and vice versa. And Paul puts them together here. That's why he tells Timothy, he charges him, chapter 1, verse 13, follow the pattern of sound words that you've heard from me, Timothy. Guard the good deposit that's been entrusted to you. That's why he said in chapter 2, verse 2 here, pass this on. Find faithful men to give this to who will give it to faithful men and keep it going. In verse 8, he just simply says, remember Jesus Christ. And in our passage today, he says, be able to teach in such a way that people can hear you, that God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. Another trap of the devil I was thinking about is is, is just continuing to read on in chapter 3. Understand this, in the last days there will come difficult times for people will be what? Lovers of self. People have been convinced today that, that self is the key. Even virtuous. What do I mean by that? How could being a lover of self be virtuous? I hear very often, just have faith. Have faith in what? Well, just as long as you have faith. What are they saying? They're saying, I have faith in me. That I'm just, I believe the right thing. What's the right thing? Well, it's what I believe. And it just comes circular and it's a faith in faith. It's a faith in self. It's a lover of self. Humble yourself before God. Money is the answer. People become lovers of money. Oh, another traps to convince. People become proud and arrogant. I find the same thing that you do over and over, that the proud and the arrogant tends to always be someone else, doesn't it? The proud and the arrogant is somebody else. Example. I'll give you a few examples from just this week of talking to people. I could give plenty of examples of myself. I'll better serve to give it to somebody else. <laughs> One person said, Gary, 
no, no one can know truth. No one can really know truth. It, it sounds humble enough, doesn't it? Nobody can know truth. Those of you who took Dr. Ott's class, what would you say that is? It's a self-refuting statement, isn't it? No one can know truth. So you know the truth, that the truth cannot be known. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it's arrogance couched in humility is what it becomes, isn't it? Or a friend of mine in the gym told, said to me this week, said, Gary, and it's a guy that I've just been building a friendship with, and we talk about the Bible, we talk about Christ openly. But he finally told me this week, he said, I just, I just can't trust this book. It's been changed. Well, how do you know it's been changed, I asked him. Well, I, I, I read it. Well, well, where did you read it? I, I don't remember. <laughs> I said, well, so you read about it, but you don't remember the book and you don't remember the author? No, but, you know, I read about it and somebody had told him about it. And I said, well, well, why is it that you can trust that author and you can trust that book? What, what kind of, I said, what kind of credentials does that author have that you're, that you're putting your faith in? What kind of credentials does that book have that you're putting your faith in, but you're saying it's more trustworthy than this book to put your faith in. I didn't tell him this, but is that arrogance couched in humility? I asked a college professor this week, who is Jesus? And why do you think he came? Here's his response. Well, the historical record suggests, and I'm quoting him, the historical record suggests he was kind, compassionate, an intelligent person with a positive impact on people's lives. I said, do you believe that historical record? He thought I was trying to trap him then. And I said, no, I'm just, uh, seriously, you, you said the historical record says that he, or suggests he was kind, compassionate, intelligent person with a positive impact on people's lives. Do you believe that statement? That's all I'm asking. And he said, well, yeah, yeah, I do. And I said, well, I assume that he's a writing professor. And I said, I assume you've read C.S. Lewis. Yeah. I assume you've read that one book that he wrote, Mere Christianity. Yeah, I've read it. Well, in that book, he, he sets kind of up this Jesus that you just described in the historical record. And he says, you really can't just say he was a good guy. And I drew out on a piece of paper, and I, I just wrote the words that Lewis had. Not, he didn't use these exact words, but people have, have, have kind of given these categories to it. Liar, lunatic, or Lord. And I said, you know, Lewis says that, and you really have to put him in one of those categories. Either he lied about it, and he knew it, trying to deceive people. Or he was a lunatic. I mean, his brothers thought that. He was like a poached egg, is what Lewis referred it to. Or he's Lord, and you bow down to him, like Thomas did when he put his hands in the physical place where the nails had been. And he looked at it, and he said, no, there's another option. And those of you that have been through EC said, yeah, I've heard Scott talk about the other option. There's legend. He didn't go there, though. He said, there's another option. He said, the other option is that the truth changes. That Jesus didn't have to be a liar. That he could have told the truth then, but the truth changed. And the truth that he told then is not the truth now. And I was kind of like, you are going, really? He had to leave at that moment. <laughs> 
I didn't have time to take him to Hebrews 13, where the Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And a matter of fact, the writer of Hebrews goes on to say, do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings. I didn't have time to think about passages like John 14, where Jesus said, I am, eternally I am the way, the truth, and the life. I didn't have time to go to John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus was God. That was the truth then. But he's not God now. It's not who he is now. He could be, but he can't be now. We didn't have time to go there and many, many, many other places. What I did have time to do for just a moment was I pulled out a a little book of the Gospel of John and just said, would you read this? It's just 21 small little chapters in the little book, just a little booklet. And I said, at least as a writing prof, it's good literature. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's good literature. And I said, but would you do me one favor when you read it? Would you pray an if prayer? And he's like, what? I said, would you just say this? If you're real, God, will you show me? Pray for that professor. Because the truth of God's word... (laughs) can change his heart. Matter of fact, I saw, I won't get into the story, but I saw that happen to one of my profs, what, almost 30 years ago in college. It was an English prof. Very same thing. He came back after reading the Gospel of John, and the truth of God's Word had grabbed him, and he was a believer then, and God had saved him. So pray that for this prof. But as I listened to him, I walked away thinking, man, this guy... This guy's drunk. This guy's intoxicated with with the worldview that he has, and he's been he's ensnared, he's trapped. To say I'm open minded, but he's very close minded to say that there really could be truth, that this really could be true. And as I thought about that, is Paul really uses the same language, verse twenty six. He hopes that they may come to their senses and escape this snare of the devil. Another way to appropriately read that would be, it could also be translated, that they may become sober. And it's the same thing that Peter was saying. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. The adversary, uh, the devil's like a, a roaring lion seeking somebody to devour. Paul uses the same language here. People need to be sobered up. I have a picture burned in my mind of what this looks like as I talk to people week by week, day by day of the gospel that need to just come to their senses and be sobered up. Several weeks ago, I got a text about five or so in the morning, and it was Chief Havener. TV, F, and R, and, and uh, we'd been meeting for Bible studies, and, and, uh, but this particular morning, he said, can't meet this morning at a, at a fire, and he needed to uh, go and help his uh, firefighters out because it was a real tough situation. Well, I think about a half hour later, I got another text, and he says, hey, if you're able, come on out to it, and it was an, would be, he thought, an opportunity you know, if people wanted to talk to a pastor, that I could be there and, and, and be available at least. And so I went out to the fire. They had already um, rescued three people from a burning home. And it was a successful rescue, and, but it was just, it, it, you could just tell the, the heaviness of the firefighters that were there even kind of after the scene. And, and so we talked the next week, and what had happened in this fire, local fire, they'd been rescued, three people, a father, a mother, and a child. But it turns out the, only the mother ultimately survived. And so the father and the, and the child didn't. And so they're wanting to, to help the mother, obviously. And the mother wants to talk to the firefighters, and so he lets, them, lets her. And, 
And she wants to know, here's her question, why did you rescue me, but you didn't rescue my son who was right there with me and I was holding his hand? She couldn't get it. I'm standing in the same room. I'm holding my son's hand. And you rescue me, but you don't rescue my son. Let me tell you what really happened. What really happened was this lady and her son were on two totally separate floors. She wasn't holding her son's hand. They weren't even together. And my first thought, I'll be honest with you, my first thought was, wow, is this lady wanting to use this horrible, tragic situation to get money out of this or something? And, and I even said that. And he said, well, not necessarily. Because you see what happens is in these fires, you inhale these gases, and all of a sudden, it changes your, rea- your, your perception of reality. And she literally thought, as she sat before those firefighters, You rescued me, but you didn't rescue my son of whom I was holding his hand and he slipped away in a fire. Now, how do you convince someone that is that certain that this is reality, but you know and it's collaborated by all these people that saw it and you know that's not reality? You know, I think about that now. Week by week, almost every time I'm sharing the gospel with somebody who's yet to believe, that they have a false perception of what reality is. And then you say, but Gary, man, when you paint a picture like that, if they need to be sober up, I mean, the devil's trap, I mean, it's, it's intoxicating, and they, they, she, she can't see anything else. Boy, it really helps us understand what God has called us to, it has, doesn't it? That it isn't something we just, we go and argue somebody or convince somebody of, that God has to change somebody's heart. That's why he says, if you look up just a couple of verses ahead of where we've been, he says in 25, the second part, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. You see, that's what we all need, and it's a gift. God may grant this person who doesn't believe that the Bible can be true, repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. Like that college prof when I was in school. No way, and he just started reading it. And God started opening up his heart and mind that it really is true. And every one of you who name the name of Christ in here can tell the same kind of story of how God sobered you up to the truth. And now he says, I want to use you. Because it's a gift. Repentance, turning from whatever's grabbed us to God is a gift. But watch what he says. He says, here's how it works, though. Here's your part in it. Because you go back to verse 24, and he talks about this metaphor, the the Lord's servant, the one who is God's. You see, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. (laughs) It's not arrogance to have the truth revealed to you and then want to pass it along and want to tell somebody else, you can know God as well. It was interesting this Friday morning in our elders' prayer time, Dr. McNally said, you know, guys, I, over this past week, he said, I didn't spend a, an incredible amount of time, just maybe an hour or so, but just I chased through the word truth in the Bible. And he said, I don't know the exact percentage, but it seemed like most of the time, God's loving kindness was connected with truth <laughs> over and over and over. So I chased it a little bit after that on Friday, and I found the same thing, that God's loving kindness, the truth in love, 
Jesus himself, grace and truth, connected. He says, be kind. You're not going to have your family member, your professor, your friend do anything but debate you when you start a quarrel. Don't be quarrelsome. Just be kind. You're not selling anything. You just, you've had the truth revealed to you. You have nothing to boast about. You've just been able to know Christ. You've been able to know the truth. Just tell about him. Just live for him. He goes on. This is one that's, for the last months, I would say, this phrase has just been grabbing me week by week, patiently enduring evil. It's a compound word. On the one side, it means to, to endure or to bear up. And on the other side, it's under bad or wrong or evil. Thus, patiently enduring evil. Because I'm like you. I hear a lot of evil spoken, lived, watched. And I think, God, the only reason that Jesus isn't here yet is because you're patient, not willing that any should perish. But that people would come to want this knowledge of the truth. Help me to patiently endure evil. Because I skipped over able to teach. Because I think that's the, the big umbrella here. We can't teach. We can't teach anybody, your kid, your family, a church, anybody, if you're not kind, if you're not patiently enduring evil, and if you're not gentle in correcting. It's not communicated. Because that's who Jesus is, and that's how he did it. <laughs> Why do I say that's how he did it? Let me, let me finish with this. John 1. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. <laughs> Here's God become man, coming to this very own, and they didn't even know him. He gets it. He understands. He came to his own, and his own people did not know him or did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. He knows what it was like to be rejected. He knew what it was going to be like to be rejected before he came. And then right before he went to the cross, he, he's praying. And in the end of John, you can look at any of the Gospels and really see this concept. But he says in John 12, really the middle of John, oh, my tr soul is troubled. But what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this purpose. This is why I came. It was for this purpose I have come to this hour, Jesus said. I don't know where you are in your interactions with, with people, but I, I'll, I'll confess something to you. When I talk to people who are yet to believe in Christ, I'm a lot more patient with them than I am with my own family, than I am with the ones that I love the most. And so it's with those who are yet to believe and those who are believe. And maybe you find yourself there. And maybe God needs to grant you repentance first before you can offer this same kind of opportunity to repent towards God and to come to this knowledge of the truth. And maybe somebody makes you argue with them all the time. I put makes in quotes. They don't make you argue with them. <laughs> Maybe somebody makes you angry, and you have to respond. Think about that. He can't make you angry. We're going to sing. I'm going to ask the band to come on up, and we're going to sing a couple of songs. The first one that we sing, one of the lines is just going to say, Your will above all else, my purpose remains the art of losing myself and bringing 
you praise. God humbled himself, became a man. He says, lose yourself. Give yourself to him. And let him use you and me to lead others to the truth. Father, 